First, give us the overview of what is covered in this monograph, because it covers a fair amount, but it all has to do with building that resilient economy. We at the, remember it's a bipartisan group, the Bipartisan Aspen Economic Strategy Group. We're really excited to be putting out this volume. It does cover a lot, as you said. There's eight chapters, all by leading experts from around the country, taking up issues of important economics, you know, economic policy challenges facing the U.S. And we segment the volume into three sections, all focused on the overarching theme of building a more resilient U.S. economy. And the first topic we take up is the need to get our fiscal house in order, addressing the high level of public debt, the rising share of the federal government spending that goes to paying down interest on the debt. All of that is really critical to building a more resilient fiscal situation. And of course, to tackle that, we're going to have to address both reigning in spending and increasing tax revenue. We have chapters written by experts on, on ways to do both of those things in smart, evidence-based, bipartisan ways um, that will rein in spending and increase revenue in ways that preserves business productivity, incentives for innovation. The second chapter of the book is about the need to build a more resilient workforce and, you know, where we are taking up certain challenges here. First, the pandemic learning loss, the COVID pandemic and the associated school closures really set back an entire generation of U.S. school children. So addressing that challenge, bringing those kids back up to school, making the spending investments in ways that are based on evidence, our authors call attention to high dosage tutoring in particular, that's going to be critical to getting these students who were so deeply affected by the pandemic, getting them back on track and making sure that this entire generation basically isn't straddled with lower levels of human capital. And as a non-economist, I can say I think it's user-friendly. I mean, there are graphs in there, but not Great. much math, <laughs> and, which makes it more accessible, for we hope, for policymakers. People in Washington, yeah. people will make decisions to do something about it. So let's focus specifically on one aspect, the first one you mentioned, which is the deficit and fiscal responsibility. That's very much in the news pretty much every day now. Uh, yeah. What do you have to say? What does your group have to say about what we can and should do about our fiscal situation? Look, for a long time, there's been a general complacency about the high level of debt and the rising deficit levels in the country, largely because we were in an environment of low interest rates. Obviously, that's no longer the case anymore. And so it's, it's important that people are now paying attention to this. I mean, we're really on an unsustainable path. The Congressional, the Congressional Budget Office projects that by 2053, our debt to GDP ratio will be 180 percent. That is far greater than any time in U.S. history. And as our author Karen Dynan writes in the, in the volume, this poses really substantial economic risks and costs to the U.S. US. This will make it harder for us to grow the economy, invest in productive cap uh, capital. This threatens to have lower you know, future standards of living for all Americans. It also reduces our fiscal capacity to address you know, shocks we're going to get hit with in the future future recessions, future wars, um, and it crowds out our fiscal capacity to invest in other priorities like national security, addressing climate change, as we mentioned, investing in the future workforce. And so she makes a very strong case that this is something we have to get under control. Um, and then runs through a litany of potential policy options for doing so while addressing or, or being acknowledging that there are political costs and economic costs to you know, making the necessary changes. In particular, we need to both rein in spending and raise revenue. Um, we do, again, we have, we have two specific chapters on particular ways of reining in spending. And it won't surprise you, David, that they're both about entitlement spending in the U.S. And so our entitlement spending on Social Security and Medicare continues to take up a growing share of our federal spending. Yeah. And there are good reasons why we have those programs. But we have in this volume, let's take up Social Security, for example. The Social Security Trust Fund is projected to run out in the not-too-distant future. And if we don't do anything about that, under current law, what that's going to mean is a 25% benefit cut for everybody. 
We need to get ahead of that problem. Mark Duggan in our volume proposes a series of incremental reforms to the financing and benefit structure of the program that would put Social Security on a sustainable fiscal path while preserving Social Security benefits for the non-wealthy Americans who rely on Social Security income. So there are smart ways to go about reforming Social Security. We just have to have the forward-looking leadership to implement them. You know, we also have a chapter by the economists Owen Zidar and Eric Zwick that point out many provisions that were implemented as part of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Those are about to expire. This is a great opportunity to take the lessons from the past five years. What did we see happen in response to those tax changes? Let's reform the business tax code going forward in ways that will raise business tax revenue without reducing business activity. And so, you know, all of these chapters make the point that it's not just about broad cuts in spending or broad increases in, in taxes. There are evidence-based bipartisan ways to both rein in spending and increase tax revenue that preserve benefits for the millions of Americans who rely on government programs, that preserve incentives for innovation and, and business investment and growth. That's what we should be doing. You know, our group, the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, we're surfacing these evidence-based, sound economic ideas. What we need is forward-looking federal political leadership to implement these ideas. Do you have hopes? I mean, you're not a politician, you're an economist, but do you have hopes that maybe a bipartisan commission, which is now being discussed, it's been proposed now on Capitol Hill, uh, on both the House and the Senate side, we have proposals now. Do you have hopes that perhaps they could work with some of the materials you've given them and others as well to have some of these, as you say, evidence-based approaches that I must say also it's not just what you do but how you do it. A lot of what you're doing, you, you feather it in, you work it in, so it's not an abrupt change. That's right. And these, these, these reforms really need to have bipartisan buy-in so they're lasting. We know this. You know, Big kind of legislative changes that happen in a bipartisan way are the ones that are lasting. And we're really, we're playing the long game here at the Aspen Economic Strategy Group. We want to make investments in this country. We want to implement, you know, or put forward policy reforms that will be long lasting, that aren't, you know, just there until the next administration comes in and rolls them all back, or are on a short term, year to year basis, or, you know, even more absurdly, just moving from one congressional crisis and government shutdown threat to the next. I love the idea of a bipartisan commission that can, you know, put forward these ideas as long as then Congress is willing to implement them and the administration, you know, will back some of these really good evidence-based bipartisan ideas.